Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to talk about the importance of the pathologist in the management of rectal cancer. So hopefully everybody agrees that good pathological quality control can improve outcomes for patients with rectal cancer and can improve management of the disease. And we do this in many ways. So first of all, we feed back to the surgeon about the prognostic factors, including staging and grading. We feed back about the status of the circumferential resection margin. And more recently, we've started to feed back the planes of surgery, which have been shown to predict outcome. And it's the CRM status and the planes of surgery I'm going to concentrate on in this talk today. But we do feed back to other members of the MDT. So we feed back to radiologists about the accuracy of their predicted staging and predicted completeness of excision at the circumferential margin. And we also feed back to oncologists about the effectiveness of any neoadjuvant therapy, whether there's a need for further adjuvant therapy in terms of positive lymph nodes or high-risk stage two disease. And more recently, we've played a role in KRAS testing. So we play a central role in the multidisciplinary team, interacting with all of the members. Now, I work very closely with Phil Quirk in Leeds, and Phil's made a, a number of very important contributions to the management of rectal cancer. One of the first of these was the identification of the importance of tumor involvement of the circumferential resection margin. This is his seminal paper published in The Lancet in 1986. And Phil was the first person to show that tumor within one millimeter of the circumferential resection margin predicted a higher rate of local recurrence. And this occurred at, at the same time that Bill Heald in Basingstoke described total mesorectal excision as being the optimal operation for patients with rectal cancer. And between the two of them, they went off around the world to educate the, the uh, multidisciplinary team in the benefits of TME and avoiding CRM involvement uh, by tumor. So as pathologists within the departments, we started to see a change in the quality of specimens. So less specimens with, with major defects as shown on the left there going down onto the muscle and more and more of the good quality TME specimens that Bill Heald was producing in Basingstoke. And we know this has improved outcomes. Here you can see the data for, for Stockholm. Uh, I think there's a line missing. This should, this should show the improvement uh, in survival of around 10% from the earlier Stockholm 1 and 2 trials with the introduction of TME surgery. We know that the circumferential margin is very important, and we now have a, a lot of data on this. And uh, Phil Quirk and Iris Nagtagal published a meta-analysis showing uh, across over 17,000 patients that tumor involvement of the margin, either by direct spread in good quality surgery or through poor quality surgery with earlier tumors will predict both local recurrence and poorer survival. And we also have uh, a number of, of, of data from, from big phase three studies showing that tumor involvement of the circumferential margin does predict a poorer prognosis. Here is some data for a, a surgeon in Leeds who has um, uh, looked at the, the stepwise uh, change in circumferential margin involvement over time as they went through the total mesorectal excision training program. So the bottom line in green is, is his data between 1986 and 89. At that point, CRM involvement was uh, in 48% of specimens with uh, a long-term survival of around 30%. As you move into 1990 to 93, we see a reduction in CRM to 37% and an improvement in survival. And then in the later period, following the full introduction of TME surgery, CRM involvement dropped down to 15% with, again, a stepwise improvement in survival. Now, obviously, some of this will have been contributed to by the introduction of radiotherapy, but much of the survival benefit is due to the improvement in surgery. We know that by feeding back the status of the circumferential resection margin to surgeons will reduce the rate of CRM involvement. And this is data from the CR07 trial. This was a UK trial randomizing between preoperative short course radiation and selective postoperative chemo radiation in patients with positive CRMs. And you can see in the first year of the trial in 1998, the CRM status was just over 20%. And at the end of the trial, we got this down to about 7% by feeding back to surgeons and improving the quality of the operation. So we know that surgical planes are important, and Phil developed a theory in the late 1980s suggesting that if we remove the tumor using appropriate anatomical planes and avoid involvement of the CRM, 
if we remove the appropriate lymph node and venous drainage, and most importantly, if we remove the whole specimen intact with no defects or perforations into the specimen, then this should be associated with improved outcomes. And this makes complete oncological sense. Here you can see a cross-sectional slice through the mesorectum. You can see the thickened mesorectal fascia on the outside of the specimen, and then within that, the lymph nodes and the blood vessels through which cancers disseminate. So any deviations into the mesorectal fascia will potentially shed tumor cells into the surgical bed and give rise to local recurrence. The prospective test of, of pathological grading of the surgical specimen was determined in the CR07 trial. And Phil developed a three-tier grading system for the quality of specimens. So we've got the mesorectal plane on the left where we see a nice intact mesorectum the intramesorectal plane in the middle where we see significant defects, and then the muscularis propria plane on the right-hand side where you see significant defects going down to the muscle tube. And in CR07, only 50% of specimens were in the perfect mesorectal plane, and one in six still had significant defects going down to the muscle tube. And when they followed up the patients for five years, they were able to show that the grading system strongly predicted local recurrence, with twice as many patients experiencing local recurrence in the muscularis propria group compared to the other two planes. We also know that the planes changed over time throughout the duration of the trial. So between 1998 and 2005, by feeding back to surgeons, they were able to improve the rate of mesorectal plane surgery from 50 to over 60% and reduce the instance of muscularis propria excisions. And we now have a meta-analysis from Iris Nagtagal and Stephen Borsch showing in over 4,000 patients from 18 studies that pathologists grading the quality of specimens does strongly predict the rates of local recurrence and survival. I want to finish by moving on to abdominoperineal excision because this is a, a, an area we've, we've concentrated on over the last three or four years. We know that abdominoperineal excisions carry a worse prognosis when compared to anterior resection for higher tumors, and this is due to the higher rates of circumferential margin involvement and perforations. And here we've got the meta-analysis of five European trials from the Dendult paper showing around an 8% higher local recurrence rate for abdominoperineal excision and around a 10% worse overall survival. So if we look at the reasons for this, the, the first major problem is the reduction in tissue volume as you go down from the mesorectum towards the sphincter complex. So the yellow line there follows the conventional abdominoperineal excision plane going down the outside of the mesorectum into the middle of the sphincters. And if we look at the specimen received in pathology, we see this obvious area of wasting in the distal rectum around the sphincters. And this is the danger area where we see margin involvement and perforations. If you follow the cross-sectional slices on, on a human cadaver, you can see at the top left a nice bulky mesorectum within the middle of the mesorectum. And as you follow this down towards the sphincters, you see the gradual reduction in mesorectal fat until it disappears completely. So any tumor within the sphincter area only has a very small distance to travel before it will present itself at the circumferential resection margin when following the standard abdominoperineal excision plane. We've also done some three-dimensional photography. Uh, so taking formal and fixed specimens, 3D photographing them, and doing virtual, very thin cross-sectional slices. And we've identified this danger area to be between four and four and a half centimeters above, above the anal verge, corresponding to the, the maximum area of, of mesorectal wasting. The second problem, in addition to the reduction in tissue, is poor visualization associated with conventional abdominoperineal excision in the supine position. So you can see the red line here where there's a tendency to deviate into the sphincter muscles and potentially produce a full thickness perforation. So here's a cross-sectional slice through that danger area. You can see around one-third of the muscle layer is missing, with the CRM being formed by the submucosa. So this is a very early T2 tumor, which is actually margin positive, so we shouldn't be seeing this with good quality surgery. And this is the reason why abdominoperineal excision has two to three times the rate of circumferential margin involvement when compared to anterior resection. We also see an increase in the number of perforations with around three to four times the number of perforations in abdominoperineal excisions when compared to anterior resection, particularly at the anterior aspect where the tissue can be very, very minimal. 
So one potential solution for the more advanced cases is the extra levator abdominal perineal excision, which has recently been advocated by Torbjörn Holman, colleagues at the Karolinska. And we've done a lot of work with Torbjörn over the last three or four years. So he advocates switching the patient into the prone jackknife position for the perineal dissection and staying on the outside of levators with a very similar technique to that described by Miles over 100 years ago in his seminal paper in 1908. So we devised a study to look at 176 extra levator specimens from a number of surgeons across Europe and compare them to a series of 124 conventional specimens. We looked at the rates of margin involvement and perforation, and we undertook tissue morphometry on the slices to look at the potential benefits of this more radical operation. The blue bars indicate the amount of tissue removed per slice from the distal margin to the tenth slice, which equates to around five centimeters, so the danger area within the APE. The red bars correspond to conventional surgery, and you can see that across the distal aspect of the specimen, there's a significant increase in the amount of tissue removed with extra levator surgery. We see this extra tissue is in all directions, so we get far more tissue posteriorly, not surprising because the majority of extra levator surgeons also remove the coccyx, but we also see a bit of additional tissue laterally and even anteriorly, and this is, is presumed to be related to the improved visibility with placing the patients in the prone jackknife position, allowing surgeons to take out all of the av available tissue, particularly at that anterior aspect in the danger area. We saw a reduction in circumferential margin involvement from around 50% in the conventional group to 20% in the extra levator group and a corresponding reduction in perforations. And we fully anticipate this will improve the outcomes for these patients. Finally, we've developed a grading system for the sphincter area of abdominoperineal excisions. So again, a three-tier system, similar to the mesorectal grading system for the higher tumors. So we have the levator plane where the surgeon's done a good quality extra levator dissection. We've got the sphincteric plane, which is what we would classify a good conventional APE, which follows the mesorectal plane right down into the sphincter complex. And then we've got the, the intersphincter or intrasphincteric plane, where the surgeon's actually gone into the sphincter muscles or caused a full thickness perforation. The first paper to describe this grading system was from the Dutch group in 2005. So they looked at the abdominoperineal excisions from the Dutch TME trial. And at this time, only 10% of specimens had a good mesorectum, and there were no instances of extra levator surgery within the sphincter area. More recently, we've gone on to do some work with Harm Rutten in Eindhoven, who uses an extra levator technique in the supine position. And Harm has been able to improve his results compared to the earlier Dutch TME study. So he was able to achieve 54% mesorectal plane excisions and 58% extra levator excisions. Now obviously there's still some way to go to improve those results and hopefully by the pathologists in Eindhoven feeding back to surgeons about the planes of surgery, they can use that data to improve the quality of the operation over time. Just to show you how good we are at grading specimens, both myself and Phil Quirk graded the specimens independently, both in the area of the mesorectum and the sphincters, and we had 70% agreement for both areas. So grading specimens is not an exact science. There is a, a, a bit of variability to it, but this is as good as the agreement as we get between pathologists for grading differentiation of tumors, which we do on a routine basis for all specimens. So just to summarize, high quality pathological reporting and feedback is essential in order to improve outcomes. We should be reporting the status of the circumferential margin, the mesorectal planes for all rectal cancer specimens, and the sphincter planes for the abdominoperineal excision specimens. By feeding these back to surgeons, we can improve the quality of surgery over time and therefore outcomes for patients. And ultimately, multidisciplinary working is critical to achieve this. So I'd just like to thank our funders, Phil Quirk, and the rest of the team in Leeds, and all of our collaborators who contributed to the data. Thank you.